This is such an amazingly powerful reading. Um, I know I say that often because, of course, so many of them are. But um, yeah, yesterday morning, I taught a seminar here called Consciously Coping with Stress. <clears throat> and I was telling some of my friends earlier that Friday night when I started thinking about it, I started thinking, who, who brought this seminar here? I just, it sounded so psychological to me. I couldn't imagine what I was going to say, even to begin with, never mind for three hours. These seminars are three hours. And, uh, you know, I went through that thing of, should we just cancel it? I was actually asking myself that. And then I sat to meditate, and in that meditation, it came to me that consciously coping with stress is the whole of our path. That's exactly what it is, because, of course, all stress is created through this, um, I don't remember the words of the reading right now, but as Swami was saying, when you're trying to use reason, and you have an I-thou relationship, and you live in that, duality, things are so stressful. Whereas if you can move into a place of consciously coping or super consciousness, the stress really just disappears. And uh, in fact, we had really quite a lovely and extraordinary three hours yesterday morning. So then I went home uh, and looked at this reading and the same thing came to me. And it doesn't always, although every reading feels always, of course, deeply meaningful and important to me. Um, it doesn't always feel like the whole of our path is right in this reading. This is exactly what our path is about, going from mind and reason to this place of, um, of the soul's power of knowing God. That's what intuition is. That's what we're talking about moving away from reason, away from logic, away from the rational, from analyzing things, and finding that place of deep, intuitive knowing, which is the only way that we can ever know anything beyond a shadow of a doubt. As long as our mind is involved, there's always doubt. Even if it looks clear at first, uh, we we inevitably start asking questions. It's the nature of the mind, of course. And we can't have these incredible insights uh, that we get throughout life from a place of the mind. They can only come through the soul's knowing. Many years ago, many years, maybe 20 now, I had the privilege, really, of going to a concert um, with Bobby McFerrin and Yo-Yo Ma. And subsequent to that, they've actually collaborated a lot, but I think that was pretty early on. And for those of you that don't know, Bobby McFerrin, um, his whole musical thing is about improvising. I mean, that's what he did. He came up with a whole new way of using the voice. And Yo-Yo Ma, who's probably one of the finest cellists in the world and who tr who's a Chinese man, and he trained at Juilliard, and he... He was at Harvard. Uh, it was all about precision. And, uh, and Bobby McFerrin had just come out of a time where he said that for two years he would not listen to any, anybody else's music. For two years because he knew something was trying to happen through him specifically and he wanted to hear it. And he told Yo-Yo Ma, he worked with him first, he said before the concert, we're just going to improvise. And it was very stressful for Yo-Yo Ma. You know, he was really used to going by the book. But in the end, and I don't remember his words, and Yo-Yo Ma is such a brilliant musician, I, I don't want to try and paraphrase what I don't remember, but in essence, he did say it was one of the mo more profound musical experiences he had had until that moment because he just stayed open and he could hear the music that was meant to come through him. He wasn't just playing the notes that were there. It was an amazing concert because of that uh, intuitive quality um, that he allowed through. 
uh, yesterday in the, um, in the workshop, somebody asked me the question, which I have asked so many times over the years, and a question that always gets asked when we're talking about intuition. It's a very good question. How do you really know? How can you know? Because the ego is so tricky. And just when you're absolutely sure God is telling you something, um, you find out many times later that really it wasn't God at all. It was your deep desire for something to be true, but you wouldn't know it in the moment. And these, the qualities that we talk about when we answer that question. Swamiji, by the way, wrote a book, a wonderful book called Intuition for Starters. Uh, very sweet book. I read it again yesterday, and it's, it's deceptively simple. But in it, he describes everything that we would need to know about intuition. So I highly recommend that you go back and read it. But throughout the course of the book, he talks about these particular qualities that we might feel if something is really coming to us from that place of soul knowing and not ego knowing. And he talks about a sense of calmness that we'll feel, a sense of it being impersonal, which is actually not, not easy because sometimes intuitions come and they're not at all what you think you wanted to hear. They're not at all what feels right. There's a, a book that I used to read, and I've mentioned it in here several times. I haven't read it for years now, but I used to read pieces of it before almost any, any talk I gave called Callings. It's a book that was written by Greg Lavoie. And the reason that I was so drawn to that book is that he's edited so many people's stories and done it so brilliantly. Uh, but it's always about people coming to a place of knowing something beyond a doubt, where they know that they're being called to do something. And they can't resist it because it's the truth. And many times in that book, there are stories that are, they're painful for the people at the rational mind level. I can't recall any of the stories except the one that stuck with me. Obviously, it touched my heart, where a woman wound up knowing that she needed to leave her family, including her three children, leave them with her husband because she was being called to do something that was so clear and real. So the, we have to have that sense of detachment. It's got to be impersonal. And that'll be a feeling that we have when we're touching in with our intuition. And then a kind of clarity, but like crystal clarity. No doubt in your mind, yes, this is the truth. And along with that, a sense of feeling, a knowing of joy. And he talks about those four qualities as he goes through. And I thought later last night, although I think we discussed it that way in the class, those four things, calmness, impersonal, clarity, and joy, really do describe what one would know when they're outside of themselves, away from likes and dislikes, not needing something to go a certain way, but really allowing the soul to, to expand and to uh, know at that place of intuitive perception at that one point, which is like what Master means when he says, center everywhere, circumference nowhere. That place of knowing that we are one with everything and that whatever comes to us is, is the truth. There's a wonderful story that I heard Bharat talk about some years ago, um, and I just refreshed my mind with it last night. Perhaps some of you read the book called The Elephant Whisperer. Uh, but it's uh, a book about a man who lived in South Africa. He's actually died now a few years ago. His name is Lawrence Anthony. And he had these wild um, game preserves that he ran. And he was very well known to, he had a way with all animals. But he particularly had a way with elephants. 
He just loved elephants and they loved him. And he got a call one day that there were eight rogue elephants that were wreaking havoc, barging through fences, terrorizing people. These are elephants. I mean, they're big and they're very dangerous when they're rogue. And they were angry and several of them had little calves and people were really afraid and they said to him, either you take them or we're going to kill them. And of course, he couldn't let that happen. So they brought the elephants to him hundreds of miles uh, away, away, but they got these elephants to him and he worked with them in such a beautiful way. I was reading this story last night of some of his experiences of being near one of the female elephants particularly and she had a little calf and he said he didn't know if she charged. He would have just like seconds to get out of the way. But he called her Nana and he was saying, Nana, don't do this. Don't leave. Because she was going to charge through these electrical fences. And he said their eyes were locked on each other. And he said, if you leave, you will all die. You have it in your power to save your whole family here. Please don't do it. And he said he could just feel her taking in his energy, but he wasn't sure. And so he said it again, looking at her, don't do this. He said, and then suddenly she just stopped and she turned around and walked back into where they were being held. And he stayed with those elephants and he loved them and he wound up living with them. And then when they were tamed, not that they couldn't live in the wild, but really they were relieved of anger and angst. They were taken back out into the fields where they belonged. And then not too long later, a whole second set of elephants from a different location were brought to him. And the same thing was repeated. And then they were taken back. Many years later, when he died, which was now three or four years ago, two days after he died, all of these elephants, they went on pilgrimage. They left where they were, and they walked 12 to 18 hours back to his home. They stayed there for two days. They had, I imagine they were having their own memorial service for him, honoring him, I don't know. His son said they stayed for two days, never caused any problem, and then they went back to where they belonged. Now, how does that happen? Really, how did those elephants know they were hours away? I forget how many miles they said it was, but hundreds of miles that they had to work. How can that be? It just leaves you wondering about how, not just animals, but how is it that this intuition works? I read a story once about a dog who was in the house with his master. The dog just started barking and barking and barking like he wanted to go out and three or four times. The guy went to go out like the dog needed to go out to go to the bathroom, but he didn't. He never went. And the guy was getting aggravated with the dog. But the dog just wouldn't quit, so finally he walked outside. He said, I noticed when I stood up I was a little dizzy. Then it passed, but they get outside, and suddenly that dizziness recurred, and the man passed out. And it turns out he was a diabetic, and he had just lapsed into a diabetic coma with a blood sugar of 700. And somebody walking by saw him and called the ambulance. And somehow that dog knew that if he had stayed inside and had that diabetic coma, that he would have died, that he could never have been saved. What is this about? Of course, there's many stories, and we've all heard many of these stories, but they're remarkable nonetheless, every one of them. And it, you have to realize what are the teachings on this path. The teachings on this path is that in the beginning, there was super consciousness, there was one. And that super consciousness manifested itself into everything we know in material form. But it's still 
of the same exact consciousness, there is still that unifying presence that holds us together, whether we're aware of it consciously in our reasoning, rational minds. It doesn't make it any less true. So when we can, or these animals can, move into this place of what, what that presence is, we can actually communicate. We can communicate through, through the essence of that love. And that's what was happening with the elephants, with no real rational mind, nothing that they had to make their way through uh, to know. They just felt this man that they loved, there was a shift in their consciousness, and they knew what it was. And if we operate that way, we too could know that. A couple of weeks ago, I gave service down in Scotts Valley, and I was talking a little bit. I'm going to talk a little less about it, but it, it's just my mind again about a book that maybe some of you have read called Stroke of Insight, written by a neuroanatomist, a PhD, who was a really brilliant woman, is a brilliant woman, was at Harvard doing some very good work, driven by a lot of heart, I will say, which I think is very relevant, went into neuroanatomy because her brother had schizophrenia and she wanted to understand more about why her brain worked the way it did and she was a Harvard neuroanatomist and her brother's brain couldn't work that way. And one morning she woke up, and I want to shorten this story, but something started happening to her and she started noticing that something was happening to her brain and being a brilliant neuroanatomist, she started realizing that the left side of her brain that is all about reason, logic, making plans, getting things done, feeling doubt, being afraid, trying to get our whole world in order. Something was happening to it. But at the same time, nothing was happening to her right brain. And the right brain is that part of the intuitive. We are connected to everything. We are connected through love. So she was being drawn over here, and she was saying, and it was so beautiful. And I thought, why would I ever want to be anywhere else? I feel nothing but love for everybody. And she was feeling so expansive. She was saying, how am I ever going to fit this being, this essence, into this little body? She was just but she didn't care, and then she would step back over here into her right brain, and then the left brain would kick in and say, hello, you're having a problem, you need to get help, something is going on. And she would say, I need to get help, something's going on. Oh, but look at how wonderful... And she describes this process, 37 years old, of going from the right brain being totally disinhibited and unfettered because the left brain was dying, which it was. They took a golf ball-sized blood clot out. And the book is remarkable. There's, if, if you don't want to read the book, there's an 18-minute TED Talk, and you'll see and feel a lot of this. But she's bringing this talk to scientists and to the whole world, to all of us. And her main point is... We have a choice. We can actually live more in tune with our right brain. But we all sort of pull over here and we honker down into the left brain because it feels so safe. It feels like we can actually get control and be in charge. And she's saying, but it's nothing like what we can have over here. She doesn't use the words we use, but she's talking about living more in tune with the divine. She's talking about meditation. She's talking about that beautiful place of intuitive perception where you just know the truth, where the mind is not doing that constant chatter that drives us all so crazy. I wanted to read to you, I 
I found a chapter last night in uh, this beautiful book. I'm sure most of you, of course, know it. Uh, Sister Gyanamata was Yogananda's most highly evolved female disciple. And it's impossible to pick this book up and just, you just feel like you're reading it anew every time you read it. It's so deep, it's so profound. So I'm saying that to you because uh, I could just read you the whole book, but <laughs> I, I'm not going to do that, I promise you. But I wanted to read, I'm going to read a couple times from it because it's, it's not to be paraphrased. This, that, that um, what's her name now? Jill Bolt Taylor, that she was talking about so beautifully and describes in that whole book about what it means to choose to live away from that which contains us, which makes us small. To get to that place at the very center of everything, at that point of intuitive perception, center everywhere, circumference nowhere, no illusion of being separate. And sister, there's a chapter in her book called Loyalty and Receptivity to the Truth. And it's a very short chapter but it's just a few of her letters that she's written. You know, Yogananda gave her this job of answering questions that were sent to him. So it says, just that says so much. Um, but she says here, much time is spent in searching for the ultimate truth, and yet the blessed fact is it is ever present with us. It is not here, not there. It is not the exclusive property of any person. It is universal like air and light. And like air and light does not have to be searched for as air and light stream into a house through open windows. So if the windows of the soul are thrown open, truth will flow in and illumine the man according to his ability to recognize and receive it. That's so beautiful. I mean, what she's saying is, we don't need to learn anything. This is not hard. In fact, in essence, what she's saying is, we need to unlearn almost everything that we've learned. Because as soon as we let our soul be open, then all of the truth is just right there. There's no resistance to it, and we recognize it. We know it to be the truth. We don't recognize most of what goes on in our life as the truth. We recognize it as a hassle, as a problem, as an annoyance. That's what happens most of the time. Not, oh my God, this is so beautiful. This is so perfect. This is absolutely where I belong. I wanted to read one other uh, peace to you from here. Oh, this is what I wanted to, I'll tell you why, because when I, when I uh, read this, this is what made me think of that book again, Stroke of Insight. So let me just read. I think your whole trouble, she's writing this to somebody who's saying, I don't really know, can you prove to me that God exists? Can you tell me for sure if I do this? That's what he's writing. Even after he's had several profound experiences with Yogananda, he gets out there and people in the world are questioning all of this and he's saying what, what we've all said at some time or another, in some life or another, prove it. Can you prove it? And this is what happens with Shankya philosophy, right? Shankya tells us, why we're going to move on to this path at all. And the why is, a very short answer, because otherwise we suffer. But at the end of that, Shankya says, God cannot be proved. He says that because we can't prove it in our mind. You spend a lot of lifetimes doing that, but we cannot do it. Sister says, I think your whole trouble is indicated by these sentences. You ask, the proof of a life beyond this, a life that is all spirit, be given you in terms of material existence. You ask that we prove God and the higher realms 
in the same way that we would prove the existence of the President of the United States or prove the existence of some city in this country. She said, this cannot be done. I love this line. This is why I'm reading it to you. This cannot be done any more than a man can prove by the multiplication table that he loves his wife. She's saying, <laughs> it's so perfect. There's no connection. Here we are trying to prove it. We spend our whole life trying to make logical sense out of something, a multiplication table. Did she just nail that? I mean, what could be more logical, more black and white, more matter of fact? Can you talk about love in terms of that? Of course not. Can you talk about God with the limited capacity of our brains, of our minds, of that ever questioning? Absolutely not. There are only certain ways through this. We've talked about it so many times. In this book, uh, Intuition for Starters, Swami, I've pulled out just highlights of it because it's such an important book. And just a few things that he says, and we all know this, but you know, the first thing he says is, you have to bring energy. The first thing that he says, bring enthusiasm and focus. How can you transform something that is pure energy if you don't bring energy there? He says, so start your, this is on a path to becoming more intuitive, on a path to being able to sit and plug in and know for certain that it's God himself that's speaking to you. No easy task. I have listened to Swamiji say in many of his talks, it is very hard because the ego is so darn good at what it does and it's not going to quit doing it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you have to bring enthusiasm. You have to bring a lot of energy. Willpower needs energy. It was such a perfect affirmation today to work with it, to transform it into power. That's what we're doing. Non-attachment. We have to be non-attached. We have to move beyond our likes and dislikes, or there is no way in the world we can hear what God's trying to say to us, because we already know what we want, and we're not going to really listen much. He tells that adorable story in the book. Let me see if I can remember it. He said, there's a man, and he's looking up to the skies, up to heaven, and he's saying, hello, is anybody up there? And this thunderous voice comes, yes, my son, I am here. And the man says, what should I do with my life? And he says, I want you to live an honest and chaste life. And the man says, is anybody else up there? <laughs> we know what we want. So if we have likes and dislikes, and they're very subtle. We have to let go of all attachments. So we bring energy, we bring enthusiasm, we let go as much as we can of our likes and dislikes. And how do we do that? We do that by calming the energy, the feelings in our heart. We do that by turning all of our emotions into devotion. We do that through our prayer, through our constant communion. Let me feel thy love in all that I do. I've told many people sometimes, men particularly come, they have a little harder time at least conceptualizing devotion. I'm not sure they have a harder time getting there, but many men do. I tell them, go to East-West, get some representation of the chakras, Re breathe from the heart chakra into your heart, back out, do it. Don't try and think about, how am I going to develop devotion? How am I going to develop devotion? That's what this whole lesson's about. Just start acting in a devotional way. Start seeing God in everyone and everything. And then Swamiji says, listen. Listen. Because I said this last week, God will not speak loudly for us. I was thinking about this this morning. And I love the song, I think it's called God's Call Within, but the line in it is, uh, listen, listen, listen. It just says, whisperings within your soul. Because over and over and over, 
I'm reading, hearing. I just heard Swamiji say it three or four times in different talks. It is a whispering. It's quiet. We're all so busy. We have so much noise going on in our minds. We're always thinking, doing. We have to start just by increments. Just start a few minutes a day being quiet. What would it mean for everybody? Turn off our cell phones, turn off our computer. <laughs> Certainly no television. Close the books. Even God alone, close it. Because we can read and read and read. But until we put ourselves in a position to have these beautiful experiences where we know, yes, I'm certain, that's God. I don't have to ask anybody else. I don't have to check it out. I feel it. I know it to be true. In order to do that, we have to make our, ourselves more quiet than we've learned how to be. And then, as Sister Gyanamata said, that is essentially opening the doors of our soul and in flies, pours, fills us. Just like this doctor was saying, how am I ever going to get all of this back into that little body. She just was giggling about it. There is no way. And she realized, wonderful. That's the wonderful news. I can't get back in there. I will not be stuck with that mind anymore. This is what freedom is. We live transcendently beyond mind in the soul's recognition of what we always have been.